This is an RNZ podcast. Parts of the hospital are on fire. I don't know whether that's the emergency department. Certainly the operating suite, the, the part of the roof has fallen. There's broken glass everywhere. There are lots of people who are taking refuge in the hospital. There are, there are people moved into the corridors. Okay, I need, I need to go. That was Dr. Hassan Abu Sita, a surgeon at Gaza's El Ali Baptist Hospital, who had been helping to treat people wounded for Médecins Sans Frontières when the hospital was devastated by a massive blast that killed hundreds of people, though no one knows exactly how many people died yet or precisely what caused it. RNZ's News at 8 last Tuesday reported it all like this. Palestinian health officials in Gaza say hundreds of people have been killed in an explosion at a hospital in Gaza. They're blaming an Israeli strike on the hospital. But the Israel Defence Forces said an initial investigation shows the explosion was caused by a failed Hamas rocket launch. Now this was easily the single deadliest incident of this conflict so far, and it's likely to be the deadliest one in all of the five times Israel and Hamas have fought over Gaza. But as you heard there, Hamas and the Israeli Defence Force blamed each other for it, and the absence of hard evidence put the media reporting it all in a difficult position, as the BBC's Middle East editor Sebastian Usher told RNZ on Thursday night. We have been trying to find out what happened at the Gaza hospital. It's still a, absolutely unclear. There are varying um, bits of information that are coming out for now. I don't think anybody can quite say uh, some analysts say that it's most likely to have been Israel. Others say mm, it seems like it might be a misfired rocket. Maybe Israel's correct. So we can't say for now. But I don't think, in a sense, in terms of the mood in the Arab world and the Middle East, that that really matters. I think that uh, the people out on the streets are showing huge anger and they will reject any investigation, any Israeli claim to say that Israel was not responsible. But reporting those claims and counterclaims, in the absence of any facts in support of or to the contrary, creates confusion among the audience. And it's also raised the anger of those objecting to reporters' choice of words. CNN's Clarissa Ward, for example, was criticised heavily on social media for mentioning the Israeli Defence Force claims and then expressing doubt about them at the same time. Not clear where this goes from here. You mentioned IDF said that they are looking into the incident, that it could potentially have been a, a, a Hamas misfire, if you like, of a rocket. We've had a look at a couple of videos that we're not ready to share online yet, but certainly it looked like an enormous blast. Hard to see uh, how that would have been a, a misfired rocket. Um, but certainly we are waiting to get more clarity. And Clarissa Ward's CNN colleague Anderson Cooper was also criticised online for referring to a huge civilian loss of life during a live report from Tel Aviv in Israel and repeating himself but then without the word civilian. It, it remains to be seen exactly what occurred, but it, it seems a huge civilian loss of life, a, a huge loss of life in this hospital. And getting the clarity that CNN's Clarissa Ward spoke of there was not easy. Among those who, alongside expert investigators, tried to sift the available evidence and cut through the information war was Alex Thompson, correspondent for the UK broadcaster Channel 4. Equally, Israel claims the Islamic Jihad failed missile was fired from here, a cemetery very close to the hospital. But look again at the video of the event. The trajectory of the missile doesn't line up with that location. Too high, too horizontal. Confusingly, the Israelis' presentation also says the missile was fired from a location down in the southwest. It can't be both. Islamic Jihad say it was an Israeli missile and they have the warhead to prove it, but they haven't produced it. And in the end, Alex Thompson's bleak conclusion was this. Israel and Hamas can tweet what they like. The truth of what happened here last night requires independent, expert investigation. Not happening. Meanwhile, on News Hub at 6 on Thursday, another British correspondent, ITV's John Irvin, put it like this. This war began with a civilian bloodbath of historic significance, and this may well be another one on the other side of the fence. Any doubt is due to a fierce information war that in truth matters little to the victims of the Gaza hospital tragedy. And even before the Al Ali hospital catastrophe amplified emotions, the hyper scrutiny of reporters' work was adding to the stress of those reporting from the war zone. Every word you say is being scrutinised 
so closely and is likely to be contested by by one side or the other or, or both and that that definitely adds to the pressure that was the uk channel 4's correspondent secunda kumani talking to the bbc's media show last week from gaza now at times broadcasters have used the wrong words and given audiences the wrong idea the BBC's Evening News in the UK last week, for example, made a rapid apology for an error just minutes earlier after complaints poured in. Earlier on BBC News, we reported on some of the pro-Palestinian demonstrations at the weekend. We spoke about several demonstrations across Britain during which people voiced their backing for Hamas. We accept that this was poorly phrased and was a misleading description of the pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Now here's the weather. And earlier this month, after the Hamas attacks from Gaza into Israel, people protested outside the BBC News headquarters in London about the BBC's long-standing policy of never labelling any group terrorists. How many Jews, how many dead Israelis does it take before the BBC can find the courage to call terror by its name? Last week, the UK's Defence Secretary criticised the policy on the BBC's own flagship radio news show, Today. Israelis are trying to get hold of the Hamas terrorists, who you don't seem to be particularly interested in, and the BBC seems to refuse to call terrorists, even though the British Parliament has legislated that they are terrorists, which is a question I haven't heard the BBC answer yet. Have you not seen any of the coverage on the BBC of the atrocities, the dead, the injured, the survivors? Yes, I have. So how can you say that we're not interested in, in those atrocities? Well, this week, the BBC's Deputy Chief Executive of News, Jonathan Munro, who's also the broadcaster's Director of Journalism, was at Sydney's South by Southwest Festival to talk about how the BBC delivers news from and about conflict zones and criticism of its fairness in an increasingly contested environment these days. I spoke to him about that at Sydney Airport just before he headed home. We've already seen journalists lose their lives in this conflict, working for organisations who are also facing the same uh, dilemmas as we are, and our heart goes out to those people. And secondly, of course, we've got an obligation to audiences to really explain what's going on. And that involves lots of people on the ground as witnesses to events, but, but also the analysis that comes with expert knowledge, because it's a very complicated situation. It's unwinding the claim from the fact is a job on all stories, but on stories as complicated and as polarising as this, that becomes a real challenge. So even if broadcasters do what might be termed to be the right thing, reporting responsibly the claims and the counterclaims, that can just leave the audience you know, at a loss for an understanding. Is that where having specialist editors or the likes of you know, Jeremy Bowen, who's been doing the job and, and knows that region for a long time, is that, is that the main way the BBC can try and address that particular problem? Expertise, which goes with you know longevity of covering the story and having deep contacts in the region, speaking to people over many, many years, is just invaluable. You, you, you simply can't replicate that. People like Jeremy and our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, and correspondents who are based in that region. We also need to talk to, to interview, to challenge decision makers um, on the ground um, and to reflect the humanity of what's going on because the main story here is about the catastrophic loss of life and the appalling conditions that people are living in, that the hostages are being held in and, you know, and so on and the humanity of that that ultimately aids understanding and audiences and the credibility of knowledge politically as well as militarily is absolutely essential. It's very difficult to report from within Gaza, and not just at the moment. That's been the case in the past as well. Uh, is that something that needs to be explained to the audience? A lot of reporting they see will come from Israel, where it's uh, practical. Um, reporting from Gaza itself, as, as we're seeing particularly at the moment, really, really difficult and dangerous. Luckily, we do have a correspondent in Gaza. He's moved from Gaza, Gaza City down to Khan Yunus in the south of the Strip a safer option than staying in Gaza City in the circumstances, but he can't report 24 hours a day. He's, he's looking after his family, um, he's got his own safety concerns which are paramount. So we then do have to add to that 
with reporting from Israel and reporting from London. Some of that is being done by people who know Gaza very well. One of our former Gaza correspondents is currently working out of Jerusalem with a lot of knowledge of how Gaza works, what Gaza is like geographically, and knowledge of the people as well. Where we can't report from any location that's newsworthy in the world, we have to be transparent about that and tell the audience. Um, and then the audience knows that wherever it's coming from, it needs to uphold editorial integrity. Well, as you pointed out, difficult to gather material in Gaza. So sometimes a lot of what people will be seeing is footage, amateur footage, cell phone footage, uh, social media content that's very difficult to verify. But the BBC, not that long ago, launched a new service called BBC Verify, dedicated to checking out this kind of material, maybe vetting it before it's used. And, And here in New Zealand, for example, we're seeing some material stamped with BBC Verify in the corner. What was the thinking behind this and how exactly does it operate? I think there's two strands to this. The first, as you say, is that there's, there's a huge amount of video out there on, on social media. We can all find it at the touch of a button on our phones. The brand of BBC Verify, that's a signpost to the audience that the material that we're looking at, not just from Gaza, but it can apply in all kinds of different stories around the world, um, has been checked by us using methods like geolocation, looking at the metadata on video, looking at landmarks that we can identify, which um, may give a clue even if they're quite far in the background of the video. We may not always be the first people to broadcast a bit of social media video because being accurate is more important than being first or fast. Of course, we all like to break stories quickly, but we'd rather take our time and do that verification process. And that means that the trust that the audience can have in the BBC's content should be retained despite the fact that it's an extremely complicated story to cover. And it can be complicated, I guess, knowing how to use that material. For example, BBC Verify had a number of individuals, um, a gunman that had taken part in those surprise attacks. One of them was identified as almost certainly being a policeman from Gaza in his portrait run. Uh, do you sometimes have to be a little wary of that information, or is it a case of, look, it's out there, it's been broadcast, if you like, on social media, and the more detail we can give people, the better? I think it's a bit case by case, to be honest. The, the overall mantra will be that something shouldn't go out on the BBC without us knowing that it's true. There are occasions we would broadcast something and we would tell the audience we've not been able to independently verify a claim. Um, and then the audience knows what we're dealing with. And we will always do our best to, to verify that. If it's not possible to do it, then we need to be transparent about that. And we need to caveat our coverage of the reaction to it with the fact that we uh, do or do not have our own verification of the source material. On the BBC's media show last week, uh, there was a short interview with correspondent from your colleagues or rivals, if I could put it like that, at Channel 4. And he was saying they were acutely aware, all of them on the ground, that almost every single word was being scrutinised by critics for bias or prejudice. Is there anything broadcasters can do to protect their correspondents from such intense scrutiny by other people who have agendas and don't like it when their own particular point of view or chosen vocabulary is uh, is presented? I think that's a very um, appropriate diagnosis of the problem. The language we use in all kinds of stories, but it's particularly true you know, in, in, in the Israel Gaza situation, is absolutely critical. Every word needs to be checked and rechecked and double-checked for any implication which is either inferred or, or implied by accident, um, because our job is to be impartial, to tell the reality of the story, most importantly through the witnessing of that story by our own correspondents. And that's why we've got a significant number of correspondents in Israel, and that commitment is open as far as we're concerned. We also have to make sure that where we, in our production process, perhaps back in the newsroom in London, for example, are adding scripts around that, explanations, leaning into that scrutiny on language, that we're using expertise, that we are mobilising our knowledge as an organisation, and that we're making sure that at every stage of that, every sentence, every paragraph is reflective of what we know to be true, that adjectives can be dangerous because they, they may imply something which is more emotive than we mean it to be. So we have to be quite clean in our language in these circumstances. Of course, people can come on the BBC and express their views in language of their choice. All of those things help 
to do two things. First of all, to keep our coverage sort of straight and honest. Uh, and secondly, to ensure that correspondents on the ground aren't endangered by slips or mistakes that are made in good faith elsewhere in the BBC's output. Uh, we're finding it across, it's a worldwide problem, isn't it? Um, established news agencies uh, suffering a bit of public cynicism, uh, declines in trust. You know, we're hearing like members of the, the Conservative Party who are in power in the UK openly criticising uh, the BBC. Is that having an impact on the way you do your jobs? I think the criticism of the BBC from politicians is as old as the BBC, pretty much. You need to listen sometimes because just because they're habitual critics doesn't mean they're wrong. But we've actually got to be pretty resilient about our editorial policy. We've got a well-developed set of editorial guidelines which have stood the test of time over many, many difficult stories. Um, not just wars and atrocities and campaigns like the IRA, for example, or the awful events uh, of ISIS or the current war in Ukraine. The editorial guidelines are robust. They're public. You can go online and look at them. Um, all of our journalism uh, abides by those guidelines. And if you have a set of guidelines that you believe in as an organization and your output complies with them, that's a significant defense to uh, some of the less well-founded attacks that we sometimes find ourselves on the wrong end of. And broadly speaking, worldwide, do you think reliable news organisations that aspire to be objective and impartial uh, and honest, can they win in the longer term against the, this growing volume of sort of amateur and partisan sources of news and content and comment, which, you know, which don't? value, uh, that striving to be objective and so on? And is the sort of traditional BBC news values going to be hard to defend as we go on? You're completely right. The news market is changing. Audience behaviours are changing. Um, Actually, I think that the proliferation of non-impartial news, opinion-led news, is actually an opportunity for the BBC and for other public purpose, public service news organisations around the world, because we believe that people recognise the difference between impartial objective news and opinion. There's room for opinion. There's nothing wrong with opinion. Opinion is part of free speech. We are very, very keen to play a very significant role in squashing disinformation and misinformation, myth-busting, if you like, because that changes the political discourse based on things that are not true. And part of our job is clearly to ensure that members of our audiences have got the information they need on an impartial basis to form their own judgments about the issues of the day. So getting under the, under the skin of claim and counterclaim, some of which falls under the heading of untrue claim and counterclaim on loads of stories, that's part of our role. And actually in that, there's probably an opportunity there for public service broadcasters around the world to play a bigger role and to use the platform they've got to, if you like, bring um, a new level of doubling down on our values Um, to the changing media marketplace. So is it not a worry for you at all that, for example, at the recent Conservative Party conference, you had senior Conservative Party figures, even your former Prime Minister Liz Truss, applauding uh, GB News, you know, one of the opinion-led broadcasters you mentioned there for disrupting the news business and actually, you know, opposing, as they put it, uh, the BBC. Is that just all noise to you, or do you have to genuinely be concerned that the party in power, you know, seems not to respect uh, the BBC and its values? Well, first of all, I didn't mention GB News, so just to be clear about that. Um, I I think GB News, uh, and there are other examples, are part of a regulated broadcasting system in the UK, and the regulator, which is a body called Ofcom, needs to do what it needs to do to ensure that regulated broadcasters stick within the rules. That's not really the BBC's problem or concern. Um, Our concern is that um, we want to uh, bring our audiences with us on a values-led editorial proposition. Now, some politicians will like that. Some politicians will not like that. That's up to them to make that case. It's not our business to try and stymie debate about the BBC. Everybody in the UK pays for the BBC, and therefore everybody's entitled to a view about the BBC. And some people express it very forcibly, and others choose not to do so. That is entirely up to them. Our job is to go out there and make sure that our journalism is the best it can possibly be. Of course, like all organisations based on human judgment, we sometimes make mistakes. That's that's life. Um, and when we make mistakes, we need to be open to uh, criticism and we need to be open to views about what we do in the normal course 
course of events. We're not short of views about what the BBC does and doesn't do. Um, and I'd love to get into a debate about other broadcasters and, and, what, and what they do. It's part of the political discourse. And where it's unhelpful, of course, um, we, you know, we wish uh, that people had sometimes kept their counsel. But we're not in the business of trying to mute people who have problems with the BBC or indeed people who endorse uh, uh, you know, um, New Start um, organisations in the media sector. It was the BBC's chief executive of news, Jonathan Munro, who's also the broadcaster's director of journalism. And there he was talking to me from Sydney Airport after he addressed the South by Southwest Festival in Sydney this week about how the BBC delivers news from conflict zones and handles criticism from citizens and politicians and even the UK's own government.